Okay, you're pushing yourself past your human limits physically and mentally, not because you are stepping up to the plate for some greater purpose, but because you're running away from negative emotions. 100%. Welcome, everyone. We are here with another interview today with uh, Weasel Ethan. I'll be calling him probably both. Hello. But, um, yeah, welcome. <laughs> good. Welcome, Weasel. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, what do you want to talk about today? So, I wanted to talk about a list of things, but so I'm in particular a rock climber. I've been rock climbing for about five years now, on and off. Where I went to college or upstate, I just graduated last year. They didn't have any rock climbing up there. So, I say on and off because I would have spurts of climbing for like six months and then I wouldn't be climbing for another six and then I would be climbing for two and then it would just be on and off for a long time up until about two years ago where a gym opened up upstate where I go to college if I say upstate I'm just mentioning mentioning specifically central New York and Oneonta is where it is but because of that I would have like these long spurts of climbing so I've really been climbing consistently for the last two years but I've had five years worth of experience what I wanted to talk about in particular, well, the first thing I wanted to talk about was just motivation when it comes to climbing. I feel like I'll have moments where it's very hard for me to figure out why I want to do climbing, or not even why I want to do climbing, but why I want to continue and keep on progressing. Because th- there's a lot of reasons for it in particular. One of them is like there's a lot of advantageous body types in rock climbing. Like you'd rather be a lot taller, have a really good strength to weight ratio. In terms of like being super skinny or not having a lot of muscle mass, but still being super strong. And then on top of that, there's something called an ape index in rock climbing, which is your wingspan should be technically equivalent to your height. So I'm 5'6, but my wingspan's negative four, so I have a 5'2 wingspan. But most people want to have like a positive ape index and not really a negative ape index. So I have a lot of things that are disadvantaged. Are a, are a disadvantage to me as a rock climber, but I still want to progress and I still want to get better. And I kind of use that as a motivation to get better. But then I see people who have positive ape indexes or are just generally stronger than me, people who have been working out all their life or just immediately get stronger and then progress way, way faster in a nine month span than to me in my five year span. And just seeing those kinds of things and comparing and contrasting, while they're good in terms of learning and understanding the sport you want or want to enjoy and be a part of, it also kind of deters me mentally in terms of wanting to progress. So, uh, Ethan, what I'm hearing is there is you have disadvantages for climbing. The the cards are stacked against you, but yeah. it sounds like part of that motivates you to keep trying. Because you don't have it easy. It does. So you got you to gotta try harder. I'm stubborn. <laughs> yeah. So have you been stubborn about other things in life? Like where you had a disadvantage and you had to like prove it to people? Um, kind of in school, but not really. So I didn't really care too much about grades in school. But I knew I was quote unquote intelligent. It's kind of hard for me to say I'm really good at things or really smart but i definitely do have some sort of intelligence and that really wouldn't show in base school grades you know what i mean but you could come up like if a teacher gave me a certain project i could always like wing my way through a project or if we had to do a presentations i would never really like prepare a presentation i would just kind of like wing the presentation the second we got there and i would do really good with that because i was able to communicate myself very well so in those aspects, yes, but honestly, not really. I never really had something that I could say, like, I really wanted to get good at and prove that I was pretty good at. So let me ask you this. Why do you, what, I mean, in this moment, right, we're just here, two dudes mm-hmm. talking. What, what's your motivation to uh, rock climb? I wouldn't, I wouldn't even be able to really pinpoint it. Besides being able, as you said before, to kind of, like, prove that I can still rock climb as hard as the people and hang with the big dogs even though i have these cards stacked against me another aspect of it is the creative aspect of climbing i'm a route setter so that means in the climbing gym i'm one of the people who actually build the the routes that you climb 
So I usually just end up saying build the walls, but then people assume it's like the actual walls you're building. It's like installing the holds in a specific sequence to create different kinds of movements and create different kinds of formulas for people to figure out and climb. And there's like an artist aspect to it for me. A lot of people don't really see it as like this artistic medium, but I've always liked to create things in life. I know you were talking about before Legos. I loved Legos as a kid and that was like a huge thing for me. I like to tell people I pretty much play with adult Legos for a living. Yeah. And I, but yeah, you get to climb yeah. it afterwards. <laughs> yeah. No, I can definitely see like a very, it sounds very fulfilling to be able to just craft something in your hands and then experience yeah. it afterward, share that joy with other people, see other people try exactly. it. You know, it's like, you know, Minecraft, uh, bodybuilding, Legos, building yeah. a rock wall. I, I, I think, you know, that, that artist, I, I can relate as a streamer and also in the fitness space, mm-hmm. just the, the artistic joy of crafting something with either like in my case physique or in the case of yeah. stream, just like all the uh, production value scenes or whatever, like that kind of stuff <laughs> exactly. I, I find very enjoyable to do. Like it's not draining. It's yeah. actually energizing, but it, it mm-hmm. but I still get this sense that there's this dark side of um, like your, your, the, the rock climbing. There's some sort of negative emotion there. And I, I want to try to figure out what mm. is that? Like why, Why do you feel like you have to um, keep rock climbing? I'm not sure. It's 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 kind of hard to explain, but it's it's something that I found in life that is, as you're saying before, fulfilling. Like I don't know why I want to keep rock climbing, but I know that I want to do it. It's something that, for some reason, it like keeps me out of the existentialism that is in the world or be getting like lost in my own thoughts Uh, i know that there's a people talk about when you're running you like enter the quote-unquote zone with this medium between thinking and not thinking i feel like that's a state that i enter a lot when i climb so it's almost like this constant escape from reality but also at the same time really pushing you into reality if you're not thinking you're not going to climb right because you're not going to be focused on your movement but if you're overthinking it, then you're going to be not particularly doing anything right because you want to make sure that every possible movement's right. And then you end up slipping because you're thinking too hard about it, you know? Yeah. So it uh, really forces you into that medium. If it's okay with you, I might interrupt a little bit more. So um, oh, I apologize. Don't worry about it. I know rude. I go on tangents a lot. Uh, but uh, yeah, if it's okay just with you, I'll, just, I'll jump in more, more frequently. Like you mentioned running away from reality. 100%. Uh, mm-hmm. what, what are you running away from? Just life in general. I tend to get very sad about the idea of life, if that makes sense. Yeah. The what fact it? that we are living creatures. fact mm-hmm. that we are, uh, what's the word? The brevity of life. That we are born to die and then eventually we do die. I'm also kind of agnostic, so it's like a little bit harder for me to accept the fact that I'm living because I don't really know what's at the end or really tend to believe in the end. Mm-hmm. So I try my hardest to live in the present, even though I'm super anxious about that kind of stuff. How do you feel about that? You mentioned a- a- anxiousness, but can you give some more color mm-hmm. to that? Uh, I I guess the best way is it's scared. I'm very anxious and scared a lot of just the idea of existing, the idea that we are here, you know. So it's a lot harder. It's hard, I guess, is the best way to describe it. What are you scared of? There's so much in life. Dying, failing. Even though part of rock climbing is to fail, you're not going to be getting everything you do every single time. You know what I mean? You'll fall 99% of the time. You could be working hours to get one problem, and then that problem's going to last 12 seconds. And then you have that moment of like, I did it, and that's cool. But then what comes after? You know what I mean? So it's kind of like a lot of meta level thinking that I kind of get stuck in when it comes to rock climbing. Let me ask you this about dying. So I actually want to focus on mm-hmm. that. Are are you scared of death? Of course. A hundred percent. What about it scares you? The fact that we finished our existence, the fact that everything that you've done, at least for me, because it's something that I'm trying to work on a lot with my thinking process is that like, what is the point of doing things if at the end of after doing things, there is nothing, then you don't do things anymore. You know what I mean? 
the fact that after death you don't know what's after death. The the I feel like that's a thing that a lot of people end up getting scared of is that whatever they're doing means nothing at the end of the day. I, I'm trying to put a um a feeling to this to what you're describing. Um, does it feel pointless? Does that resonate with you? Yes, that's a very, a very good way to describe it. Feels pointless. Um, but what about being scared of the unknown? No, hundred percent. I'm I'm just trying to get a sense for if anything in particular resonates with you, or do they both like equally resonate with you? No, I think both of those are two very poignant topics that are very hard for me to not think about on a day to day level. When else and I have kind you... of use climbing as that? Yeah. When, when else have you been um, scared of the unknown or anxious about the future? Um. Well, the first thing that came to my head is food. Uh, I've always been like super scared about getting sick and particularly involving my stomach. So for like a while, I mean, I could think about back to like going to eighth grade. I would have like moments where I would go to a restaurant and I'd be afraid to like throw up or just like get sick. When did that and there start? are moments where I like uh, as young as I can remember, but I have like very vivid memories of it being in like early middle school what happened in middle school so the, there's one particular moment is like the earliest that i can remember there's a, a japanese restaurant that was like close to my old home and i was just like eating udon soup and i was like feeling sick and i was like telling my dad like hey like i definitely am starting to feel sick he's like nah don't worry about it. you're not sick They're like there's no way you're sick i'm like no nah, no nah, i'm like pretty sure i'm feeling not okay right now. It's like, no, don't even worry about it. You're definitely not sick. And then I immediately vomited. <laughs> like, just right there. Vomited all over the table. My dad just, like, looking at me with discontent. And I got escorted out. And my dad sat there, waited for the lady, uh, or, like, the waitress to come to pay the bill. And we ended up, like, leaving early. And I can just remember being so, like, unvalidated is the best way to describe it. Because I definitely was feeling sick, but then someone was like, no, you're not feeling sick. And then I vomited, which is something that happens when you're sick. You know? Yeah. Can I think for a second? I'll go for it, brother. I'm trying to connect the dots here because we we're talking about mm -hmm. being scared of the unknown started in middle school and then we kind of transitioned over to a feeling invalidated at the, mm -hmm. um, you know, get scared of getting sick and mm -hmm. feeling invalidated at the, uh, the restaurant. Cause I, to me, mm -hmm. those, those seem like two different emotions. I'm just kind of talking out loud here. Uh, but mm -hmm. like the, the scared of getting sick, I could understand that makes sense that you would be scared of getting sick because of this experience where you're I'm going to guess you also felt ashamed, um, probably a mixed yeah. bag of emotions, you know, publicly yeah. you 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 were asking for help. You know, your dad, who's supposed to be there to help your parent, um, kind of invalidated your request and said, like, no, yeah. you're going to be fine. And you weren't fine. And then it ended up being a lot worse and you, you weren't listened mm -hmm. to it. So. um to me, I, I'm trying to connect that with uh, scared of the unknown. Are you able to help me out? Yeah, it's kind of like thinking about in the sense of reactions. I'm saying like, I don't know how people are going to react to me verbalizing my thoughts or me experiencing the things I do. So I kind of tend to try and keep to myself in that respect. So I'm afraid that like if I tell people that I'm not feeling too well, they're going to say I'm not feeling well. I'm not going to know really how they're going to respond. I might think something, but after I'm thinking these things that I'm, or I'm thinking my thoughts, people are going to say that it's like, that's not the case or that's not true or what you're thinking is actually this, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It does. Um, I'm just trying to find some connections here. Mm -hmm. And because I, I think a lot I agree that using exercise because something we talked about earlier off stream was how it's a um, a 
exercise can be a coping mechanism to help us escape reality. Mm -hmm. And the exercise is the rock climbing might be your solution to your problem. And the question is the pro what is the problem? And the problem is you are running away from something. What are you running away from? We're running away from death, running away from feeling scared, scared of the unknown. All of these, I, I'm just getting a sense of there's not one thing. There's a big mixed bag of emotions. Um, there's yeah. not just uh, um, scared of unknown and dying and pointlessness, but also feeling invalidated. Um, people rejecting your thoughts or feelings when you open up. Um, because I'm yeah, going to exactly. guess when you're in the moment, when you are climbing, there is no rejection. There is no negative emotions. It's just almost like do or die, like you mentioned. Like you have to. Yeah, perform. exactly. There's no room to think about very anything else. Primal. Yeah, and that that I could totally understand. It's, like, it's very, um, it's relaxing in a sense because it kind of takes mm -hmm. a lot off our mind. I'm just wondering mm -hmm. is is there anything else that you're trying to avoid or escape from? There probably is, but I don't have tangible knowledge or words to verbalize it because there's always something you know what i mean yeah. in my head that i'm always constantly worried about but i might not be able to root it very well i, I, I recently think... started going to therapy so it's like okay How's after that going? starting this journey oh it's been going honestly so great i wouldn't even be able to tell you exactly what i'm thinking Unless I've had this journey that I started on, because I've had very bad experiences with therapy in the past. In the past, but I found a very good therapist who's really leaded me onto a, a really good path and being able to actually figure out a lot of what's going on in my head. But it's taken time, and it's something that's very recent for me. Can you help us understand what's going on in your head, or like what you've learned on your journey? For those who might be interested in therapy in particular. Well, of course. So. One thing in particular that I can like very definitively say is I've had these stomach issues, quote unquote, right? Mm -hmm. Going on with the story from before about having that vomiting experience, I've always felt like if I ate certain foods or like I had certain emotions that my stomach would start to get really sick. And it would start to have like these feelings of like negative emotions tying with stomach issues. So if I was like in college and at a party, right? And I would start to feel like sick in my stomach. I wouldn't know why in particular I was feeling sick, but I knew I had to like get away. So I would like tell people like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm like not feeling good right now. And I would like run away from the party and then like go home. And then the stomach issues would like immediately stop. So I wasn't able to figure out why that kind of stuff happened. Lo and behold, like come this last J July, I'm graduating in college. I'm not sure what I wanted to do. The route setting job really didn't start. And I started to get really sick. I had like this two week period of just like vomiting. And I would lo I lost a lot of weight in that period as well. And I started to go to a gastro and I started to go to, well, I, the gastro gave me like multiple different doctors to go to in order to get like a bunch of testing and nothing was wrong with me. So the doctor was saying, like, I think I used to smoke uh, a lot at that time. And he thought that like it was part of that smoking. He was like, you have to stop smoking. Like, that's the issue. And I felt like something in my head like that, that can't be the issue. That's definitely not. But at the same time, when you think those kind of thoughts, then you're thinking, oh, well, it could be me having it uh, a, like another coping mechanism that I'm leaning on or like some other issue in that sense. So I ended up going to therapy out of a whim. And through the therapy, I started to realize that this is an issue I've always had. I've always had anxiety really tied to my stomach. So one thing a doctor was saying was like, this is definitely the problem. But after going through therapy, I felt and or kind of realized that like the problem was I had very bad anxiety and I've always had very bad anxiety, but that anxiety would manifest in physical symptoms. And it, that's something that I've always had, but I couldn't really pinpoint it. And I would always kind of like say it was this or say it was that and say it was like thousands of other things. But at the end of the day, it was really anxiety. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that, because oh, I think course. so many times um, we we are in tune with our body in terms of mm. how our mind affects our body, our emotions affect our, our body and vice versa. And I always encourage people to. Uh, a couple of things. One is just know what you're like at your best as a human and know what you're like at, at yeah. your worst. Like 
how you become like on a bad day or when you're stressed or you become destructive if you are outwardly destructive or inwardly destructive, like just learning to recognize that. It's same with like your yeah. strengths about how you're like at your best, how you're th- when you're thriving, how you can really help yourself or those around you, something like that. I think that's just uh, uh-huh. two really uh-huh. generic pieces of uh, un- self understanding. And then the other one is like you mentioned, how does stress affect you? And, and like I was kind of smiling and nodding along yeah. because I'm the same. When stress hits me. Like when, when people feel stressed and, and chat, feel free to share. When you feel stressed, where do you feel it physically in your body? And if you're not sure, just think of any time you've been stressed. Um, mm-hmm. Where did you feel it? And some people get like a tight chest. They have a hard time breathing. They feel like a lump in their throat. For me, I'm probably the same as you, which is I feel the knot yeah. in my stomach, um, yeah. like the, the pit in the 100%. stomach. And um, it's like the small intestines area stomach and it just it feels tight. I lose my appetite. Uh, I don't feel necessarily nauseous, but like I don't want to eat. I stress starve. I, I would guess you're also yeah. a stress starver, right? A hundred percent. Yeah. Some people are stress eaters. <laughs> really Some bad people sometimes. are stress starvers. Yeah. When I'm stressed, same yeah. thing. I lose my appetite. I don't I want yeah. to fix things. I mean, this is probably where I might differ from you, but um, I don't want to eat until I fix things. I got to make things right. And that's probably like my, I probably need therapy for that. They're like, or I need to look into that myself about why I need to fix <laughs> yeah, things. Exactly. But um, that, that's just, what, just my default mode. And I think being able to recognize that is so huge. Um, 100%. As someone who has also um, uh, gone through something similar to you, my here are, are my just direct practical tips and suggestions because I've I've kind of, of learned course. to overcome that too. One is actually hold on, before I before I give those tips, I'm just curious: Does autoimmune disease run in your family, or you, or anything like that by any chance? So I've been told that it doesn't, but it is something that I want to look into, as well as look into um, thyroid issues. Okay. Because I do have a very hard time gaining weight, and I, I do eat a lot. Depending, like unless I'm had super stressed, as you're saying before, that I tend to just not eat at all. I'm very good at just not eating. I, it's kind of something that I've had to start manually doing. I didn't eat breakfast at all. Like never in my life was I just like woke up and felt hungry until I started going on medicine. I'm on Lexapro right now. And you need to eat when you take Lexapro. If you have it on an empty stomach, it's very hard for it. You'll start to feel like very sick in your stomach. And then if you have anxiety issues, it'll start to spiral, right? So I've started to eat breakfast very manually now as well as like watching my protein intake in order to try and gain weight um 117 right now the the lowest i've been because i've had another one of those like sick benders uh, a couple weeks ago and i lost i was 130 i went to 110 so i've been trying to slowly regain that weight back okay but it's been like a process of very managely watching it that's something that um we can touch on later if you're interested yeah, about like eating more. Um, but I'll yeah, say w- with the, um, the stress stuff, um, what's helped me personally, cause I feel like we kind of relate to this is um, when that knot of stress is there, a, a couple of things. One is just um, noticing it and also um, some mm. heat pads and massaging. If it's like particularly stubborn, it's really staying there. Mm. I think okay. a heat pad and a massage is very useful. I had this one um, Eastern medicine um, chiropractor uh, acupuncturist, and he did this amazing massage. Yeah. It's hard to do it yourself, so you might need to get like some sort of ball. Let me grab a ball right now. Yeah, go for it. I'm very intrigued by it, actually. He, um, either a, a, a ball, so I'm holding like this big softball, or you can use your hands lying mm-hmm. down. Uh, just imagine I'm lying down. Uh, and mm-hmm. the the you find the sore spot, which is going to be probably it's around where the small intestines was. He says the small intestines were stressed and you find that spot and you can either use like just your fingertips to apply pressure or the entire palm of your hand. Uh, again, it's going to be difficult for you with um, with because you're doing it yourself. It's a weird angle, but basically find that yeah. that sore spot and then do uh, let me think clockwise. He, he was very specific about uh-huh. it has to be clockwise, not counterclockwise. I don't understand why. Uh, I'm guessing it's Eastern medicine thing or about like where the organs were, but that always felt good. Mm-hmm. So just a few minute, like a heat pad and a few minute massage, find that sore spot that feels like where you feel the stress manifesting and just physically massage okay. it. So if you have a hard time applying pressure because it's, you're doing, I mean, do you have, 
if you have someone else who can do it, that'd be better because it's it easier angle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you have a hard time doing it yourself, whatever tool you can use would be good. So like a softball, obviously a softball, is, it'd, it'd be easy to go too hard. So you have to kind of like gauge how mm -hmm. much pressure you can do. But just this, the softball, for example, just gives you more leverage because it's awkward to lay down and just kind of like rub your own stomach. But those two, um, I think, help with the physical, the physical um, symptoms. And uh, the second thing I would say is um something i learned from dr k uh because he mm -hmm. I, I was on a show a long time ago i don't think the vod is up anywhere yeah, yeah. but uh one of the things he told me to do and he as a meditation was basically um learning to kind of notice it and uh, for dissolve it for lack of a better term and so what he would have me do is um trigger the anxiety like in small doses like just think of the mm -hmm. thoughts or whatever is like bothering me um think mm -hmm. of it a little bit let that emotion rise when it rises and manifests itself physically in my body in this case for me it's the intestines uh wherever for anyone listening mm -hmm. wherever in man like if it's tightness in your chest or whatever just just notice where the physical manifestation is so you're closing your eyes you're thinking about okay the stressful thought you let yourself get a little bit triggered you notice it rising wherever it is so in my case it's the stomach and then you notice it. You stop thinking about the thought. You just notice it. And you just stare at it. And then you start breathing. So you inhale. So you inhale. As you're inhaling, you just pay attention to the temperature. Like you, you draw your focus to the temperature of the air, which is it's probably going to be cold air coming in. Mm -hmm. And as you're, you're doing that, so you're noticing the temperature and you're also simultaneously um, imagining that you're breathing that cold air into the spot of wherever it is in your body. Mm -hmm. So I'm breathing that air into my stomach. I breathe that coldness into my stomach. But then as you're exhaling, you visualize you're exhaling from that spot and notice the temperature. And so I notice that it's, it's warm and it's kind of hot and I'm exhaling it out. And so you repeat that process. So it's a combination of noticing it and like basically staring it down. And then also thinking <laughs> of the air, the temperature and breathing into it and then exhaling from it and thinking of the temperature again. Um, I found those two to be helpful in um okay. kind of resolving the symptoms and kind of um uh getting over it in a sense obviously uh the long-term solution is to deal with the source and the source is like yeah. why do you feel anxious about these things why do you feel it's all pointless why do you feel invalidated all that stuff which um i think talking with people is um talking with people or friends like this or in in therapy uh exactly. can be really helpful to unpack that but um now i i feel like we made really good progress really fast uh how are you yeah, what do you think so exactly far? yeah we're talking about a lot it's, it's really good i enjoy the conversation so far yeah i was same. gonna say i wanted to write all that stuff down but i can actually yeah, go ahead, I just no, go thought ahead. about it i could just look at the vod no i can look at the vod mm -hmm. later and then i'll write it all down okay i'd rather so, not try and like interrupt you that way yeah yeah no worries um so that means um uh, that the next thing I, so I think we already kind of know where some of these native emotions come from. And then it, this comes now back mm -hmm. to uh, the real question, because like, man, we went fast. Like, so like the real question now is <laughs> yeah. uh, the rock climbing. Should you keep yeah. doing it? And do you want to keep doing it? Because I hear it's an, it's an adaptation that it's, it's a healthy mm -hmm. adaptation, right? Like physical activity is a good thing. It's a hell is it adaptation to run away from these negative emotions. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it also provides some positivity for your life because it's a creative outlet. And so the question for you yeah. is, do you want to keep doing this? It's kind of hard to describe because I, when it comes to like things in terms of positive emotion, I can't really say like, I know what love feels like. I know what having a passion feels like. I know I really enjoy these kinds of things. You know, I'm so very rooted in my own negative self and the negative emotions that I feel. So when it comes to these things, it's like, I know that when I climb, I'm not thinking. I know that when I'm climbing, I do feel like this sense of I enjoyed that or like I'm enjoying what I'm doing. But it seems more of like this. Um, I'm running through a tunnel and I don't know where the end is, right? And I know that like I'm keep I keep on making these steps, but like what is the point of me constantly making these steps? And then it comes to like an existential question of like why do we do anything? 
well, there, there's no point to not doing anything. I only have two routes to go from that. I can either choose to then accept the fact that it's pointless and then do nothing or accept the fact that it's pointless and then give life my own meaning, right? So I've chosen, or I've chosen, I've chosen to bring the path of putting my own meaning into things because it feels a little bit better, you know, than wallowing, which is something I've done for a long time. So I, I feel like, why not? At the end of the day, just why not? I do enjoy it, but I don't know if I love it. I feel like I do, but I don't know. Man, um, there's so much good stuff to talk about. Um, I, I, <laughs> I, I'm putting down a note to, to maybe we can talk about like the philosophical stuff about spirituality and, and uh, meaning and yeah, uh, purpose. Uh, I'm just I would love to talk about, about that. My own notes. Yeah, I, I can yeah. I can put that down there. Yeah. Um, one thing yeah. I, I want to talk about is I don't think it's going to be easy for you to make a decision about rock climbing being for you while you have all these negative emotions because mm -hmm. it is clearly an adaptive mechanism that's protecting you from negative emotions which i because you talked about burnout right that my, my understanding my very limited understanding so feel free to correct me is you're basically pushing mm -hmm. yourself physically and mentally past your human limits and you're doing that as not because you're running towards something not because you're stepping up to the plate to um to overcome uh, let, me, let me start this analogy over you're not you're not okay you're pushing yourself past your human limits physically and mentally not because you are stepping up to the plate for some greater purpose but because you're running away from negative emotions 100 percent. and i think but that, it's kind of in the good oh my god uh, go i was go gonna say it's kind of in the sense that like i'm i've ran so far away <laughs> that i've like made it almost somewhere you know like i i wouldn't say that i'm a strong climber but then that also comes into the fact of me not like willing to validate myself but objectively so there's a thing called the moon board right which is a training mechanism in climbing it's a system wall so that means it's a it's a 40 degree angle wall that has holds on it that are permanently on those uh and on that wall in a specific set right the set has these holds that will never change and they're in the specific organization you could connect to it with an app and then bring up problems by like changing the combinations of holds via length. So I'm gonna start on like A1, move to C10, and then finish on like A16, right? And that's like a, a problem that you can make. And there are 40,000 different combinations of problems, right? This is kind of what my stream is revolved around. And the benchmarks are the best of the best, right? They're considered like the standard for the climb or the standard for the set. There are 422 problems. So like my goal for the stream is to see if I can get every single problem. It's not something I could currently physically do, but I'm definitely past where I thought I'd be able to do. I didn't think I'd be able to finish 262 of them and let alone still seeing progress, right? Currently, I'm technically, or currently, I'm top 900 in the world on the moon board. And that's something that like I would never be able to think in life that I'd be that high up in a ranking system at all right starting at like ten thousand and now being like top 900 like that's objectively a pretty high number so i've pretty much ran so far away that i've almost made it somewhere that it's kind of like why am i what's the point of going back when i've made it so far yeah you know? um man so much good stuff uh, let me let me ask one quick question. <laughs> that last part you just mentioned Go for about it. what about what's the um about you made it so far. Um, what's the emotion there? Are you afraid to give it up? I'm definitely afraid to give it up, and at the same time, I like am afraid to keep pushing. What are you afraid it's of? Kind of like I'm happen to stand, if you keep though. pushing. It's not. Uh, I'm afraid that I can't do it right. Because I see these people who are so strong and are so strong so fast and as well as understanding like my body. So, for example, a lot of moves on the moon board are very wingspan dependent. There's probably there's one or two problems that physically I probably can't do. Not just out of like, OK, eventually if I work up the strength for it, 
or if I eventually work up the like correct technique, I'll be able to get it. Physically, it is my wingspan's limit. I would have to do some pretty superhuman shit in order to like figure out the problem, but I don't necessarily want to say I can't do it. But I think that if I push myself hard enough, I might be able to do it. But at the same time, I'm afraid that it's like, I don't, I, you can't do it. Like, there's most likely the fact that I physically cannot do these problems, but I still want to keep on trying. But at the same time, I'm like afraid to keep on trying because I don't think I can do it. What's going to happen if you can't do it? Technically, nothing. But the feelings that I would feel would be pretty devastating. I would feel like I've gone so far that there's like no point in trying to stop. And would also understanding like your own physical limitations. I've already thought that I would not get past my physical limitations currently, but I've definitely made it so far. So it's kind of like almost like it's beyond me now where I've gone to such a high point. I want to prove to other people. I want to prove to the people who are super advantageous in rock climbing. And I want to prove to the people who are disadvantageous in climbing that like, hey, you can do this. And hey, also like, look, I can do this as well. I was going to curse, but then I realized I just put it. <laughs> Why do you want to uh, prove it to them? As a sense that like, I feel like it doesn't matter in their world, but it matters in our world, right? Like for them, their regular is having these advantages in rock climbing and being super long being able to climb super hard naturally or being able to reach through things that people can't reach. So they don't really think like uh, there's a, a huge argument in the climbing world. It's still like theory because there's not a lot of proof behind it of is having a shorter wingspan better than having a longer wingspan, right? Because the two options behind it are, or the two opinions behind it, or if you have a long wingspan, then you could reach through a lot of things. It's a lot easier to physical from here to here because you have the distance right then the like the the thing that people say for having like a shorter wingspan is that there's more leverage because there's a shorter difference to go or shorter distance to go from like one span to another you're so, able to like I, make I, I that move get too quicker technical. and stronger i don't get too technical yeah, in the details here i want to because i think we're gonna um the real money is why you like i want to i want to know why do you feel like you have to prove something? Because there could be something there, mm -hmm. there could not. I'm just kind of probing to see what's there. Oh, no, 100%. And it's, it's, it's easy for us to kind of uh, uh, drift away from that I through technical details. details. Yeah. But yeah, 100%. So, what I'm hearing is you want to prove things to people. It almost feels like you're in the tribe of short wingspan and you got to prove it for your tribe because it means a lot to other yeah. people out there that you are valid. You're not invalidated as a short wingspan group. Does that resonate with yeah. you? Yeah. Uh, short wingspan, short height. I got small thumb. Like, there's so many things that are, like, in terms of disadvantages for my body type in particular that it's... I want to be able to show people who are worried about having any body type in particular being a little bit more overweight than what is classified for a climber or anything in that spectrum that it's like, why not? Like you could do this a hundred percent. There's nothing to say you can't do it. Have you else also felt um, invalidated before besides that case with your dad in the restaurant? When you were All the puking? Time. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah. 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 Uh, in general, in particular with invalidation in life or with my dad in particular in life, other examples. Oh yeah, all the time. Um, I well, trying to think about like particular examples, but I just generally feel invalidated. I feel like I'm not good enough on a general sense for day to day. If that makes sense. It's kind of hard to like think about specific moments because I'm kind of like condensed all of the moments into feelings and i don't really remember a lot of the moments anymore when it comes to like my dad in particular i could name like one or two moments but like in a general sense i just generally feel like i'm not good enough when did you For start a lot of things when did you start feeling not good enough as long as i can remember 
being a young, young little boy, like <laughs> as young as like elementary school, I felt like there was always like something that I had to prove in a sense. But I didn't really know what I was proving. You know, you kind of just wanted to show the world my things. Do you want to you have any stories come to mind about we're trying to show the world your things? Which hmm. I, never mind. I was gonna say a sexual innuendo, but uh, that's gonna derail. <laughs> yeah, that's just, gonna derail. That's, that's so great. tell me more about the things you want to show <laughs> the world. Yeah, sorry, world. Maybe another <laughs> website. <laughs> the after stream. <laughs> I'm trying to think of it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm trying to think in specific moments. Um, I used to do. I used to be into MMA as a kid. I did Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and Muay Thai for a long time. Uh, but that also kind of resonated with the fact of me being short and small and skinny that I kind of had to like prove in a sense that like, nah, like I could still beat up people, which is like such a weird thing to prove. It's very like primal and, and hyper masculine in a sense that like I could still do these kinds of things and still like take down someone who's six foot tall and I could do it pretty easily. But it's like, there, there, what was the point of doing that, you know, as a kid? And uh, there are obvious. Uh, I want to jump in for a second. You mentioned uh, yeah, yeah, being yeah. short, um, skinny. Uh, when or how did you learn when you were a kid? When or how did you learn that you were short and skinny? Probably from my family. A lot of everyone in my family is short, uh, besides my mom's side of the family. But my mom's also adopted. So, like, her side of the family is all like above six feet. My grandma's six foot. My grandma, my grandpa was six five, and then my uncle and aunt are both like six two. So everyone on that side of the family is super tall. And then my dad's side of the family, I think my bro my little brother is now the tallest at five seven. I mean, he'll say he's five eight, but like <laughs> there was always like this thing to yeah, prove we, we like know. how tall they were. But, yeah, but exactly. Like, question, sorry about that. <laughs> so Ethan, my question is, how did you learn, or when did you learn, as a kid? that you were short and skinny. It wasn't like any particular moments. I was just always like very observant, even as a young kid. So it's kind of like I could look and be like, oh, this guy is like, as let's say like being in uh, second grade, just like observing the people around me and understanding the differences in how people talk and people react, people kind of go about their day to day. I was very observant as a kid. So, Ethan, how so did that make you of, feel yeah, yeah. when you were observing that? How did that make you feel? It kind of made me feel sad because I didn't understand the point of it. That Why are people made differently? What is the point to, like, someone being the way they are? Like, it was very odd to me as a kid. It made me, it made me feel sad as a kid because I didn't understand truly what I was feeling. I just knew at like a very base level about it. Can I try to color that for you? Now that we're, we're go for it. You, you're older and we look back at that emotion, would you say you felt pointless or invalidated? Very much so. Because something very that, much so. that um, you know, Dr. K talks about is the emotion that we experience at whatever age as a child kind of gets locked in at whatever it is. And we can't really color it mm -hmm. until we're older. We can understand things better. If we go back to explore 100%. it, then we can kind of see how that emotion, the general feeling of sadness, that actually that mm -hmm. sadness was something more. We just couldn't figure it out as a kid. But then we start to tie it together. And so like the theme that I'm seeing here is there's, there's the, the theme of, you know, feeling pointless, invalidated. And, um, mm -hmm. The Dharma or, or purpose for you in, in this case, I'm getting the sense that you have to feel valid with the rock climbing because you are you are a disadvantage with your wingspan and your uh, your genetics, your biology. And so you've got to prove it, not just mm -hmm. for yourself, but to prove it to the other people in the climbing community who are also disadvantaged and to prove it for the young Ethan who felt invalid because of his yeah. uh, body type. What do you think about that? I would 100% agree with you. I appreciate you coloring it a little better as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I definitely would agree with that.
it's it's something I don't like uh, I don't like to think about or I don't like think about as often, but I tend to get lost in the past very easily, so I try to avoid that as well as it comes with anxiety, I feel like. It's very hard for me to live in the moment. So I kind of try to do my best to not think about the past or the future. So I kind of tend to lose memory of a lot of things. I don't, and I only remember the feeling itself, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. You know, I, I don't have a good answer for this myself about um, <clears throat> productive versus unproductive wallowing in the past or ruminating yeah. in the past. I don't have a good answer for that. All I know is I'm kind of an outcomes driven guy and I'm going to guess mm -hmm. the outcomes in your life so far is just not working for you in terms of avoiding it and avoiding not thinking about it. I would agree. And it probably is going to take some time and exploration uh, to kind of unpack this because I'm going to guess I, my sense for you, Ethan, is there's mm -hmm. this. Uh, trash can of emotional baggage that you is overflowing has been overflowing for a long time and it hasn't been explored and instead of emptying the trash or like dealing with the trash rock climbing gets you out of the house and it kind of lets you forget about it a hundred percent it lets you just to a day. Man, I don't have to smell yep. that trash right now. We can just get yep. out of the house and come back like, oh, the trash is still overflowing. Let's just yeah. get out of the house again. Let's go climbing again for, I don't know, seven days straight. And my fingers are hurting. Yep. And my body's breaking down. Lit yeah. 1,000% agree. <laughs> I, I think I don't think the climbing is the problem. I, I think the problem is what are you running away from? What are you running towards? Yeah. And that, I think, is – the where the real exploration needs to happen um the the rock climbing okay so i, I don't think it's a good idea to make decisions when we're driven by negative emotions of like fear anger anxiety depression whatever um mm -hmm. and if you're thinking about because something we talked about earlier was like rock climbing should you keep doing it i think that was a, a discussion point and i don't think i have a clear answer for you but i don't think there will be an answer for you until you kind of clear up a lot of these negative emotions that is driving you towards that. So um, mm -hmm. it, it, it you've still made it, you know, made it made it uh, um, a far distance. And it, it, it's so rare that like anything that we do in life is 100 percent positive emotion driven or 100 percent negative emotion driven. There's always yeah. a mix. I'll, I'll give you a, I'll share a quick example about myself uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, um, streaming. So I actually started streaming. One of the reasons I started streaming, there's multiple reasons, but one of them was I was running away from a void in my life with a fallout from one of my best friends. We used to play a lot of games mm -hmm. together. We had a rough falling out and it was a lot of negative emotions that I did not deal with well. And I say I deal with well, I mean, mm -hmm. I didn't know how to process it and I never really processed it. And there was that whole of like, okay, like we used to game together. Now, like we're not gaming together. So what are we going to do? Uh, so I'm going to do this time, yeah. you know, um, spend it with my wife. <laughs> no, that's a separate <laughs> issue. But anyway, um, so <laughs> I have issues too, guys. But anyway, yeah. um, so I, I, you know, one of the things it. that I turned towards was streaming and creation, right? Because it's, it's so yeah. like therapeutic because what it takes our mind off things 100%. And, and two like it is a a dharma or a purpose where i am moving towards something and it's a positive thing i'm helping people on stream i'm creating content that's improving lives damn that's a hell of a drug and it helps us forget about our problems um Completely agree. now it was uh, i wouldn't say maladaptive or extremely was maladaptive for me or, or like you know a negative adaptation it was both good and bad but i and looking, I mean, like since then, I've kind of processed things and I'm fine. Um, but uh, it's so the negative emotions are kind of gone with the streaming, and it's just like, okay, I'm just you know doing this as a a good positive thing. And uh, there's still there's still the joy in creating it. There's still the purpose of I am uh, helping people out. And so I could see some similarities here with you, where you uh, are on the one hand, you're running away from this emotional baggage. And you're also running away from the pointlessness, being scared of the unknown, the anxiety, feeling invalidated. You're running away from that. And at the same time, the you're stepping up to validate those. Like you're I almost get a sense of a purpose here. You're stepping up to validate those that feel invalidated because you felt invalidated. 
and you're wanting to help well, those. I, I would agree. And so like, there's there's some positivity there, but I, I do want to say to be careful because there's there's also like a subtle hint of of negative emotions there. It is easy mm -hmm. to kind of repeat the process of bearing these emotions by picking up a banner, and that banner is to mm -hmm. it, it if how do I say this? It there's a fine line that I do not know how to walk or to even discuss. So I'm sort of just throw it out there that I, I, I suspect it is not, it could be easy to not solve anything by picking up that banner to validate others that you wish was validated really for you. And it's okay to stand up for other people, but I think we have to look introspectively about why we're doing this and um, make sure it's coming from a good place. You know what I mean? What do you think I would about agree that? With that. It, so for for example, like I always changed what I wanted to do in life in terms of like I used to want to create video games and then I used to want to make movies and then I used to want to make music videos. And those are all still things that I would love to do because the root of why I wanted to do them, because I wanted to make things and I wanted to make people happy. I wanted to give them an escape. But the reason that came to be is, as you were saying before, is to make people not feel the way I'm thinking. But by doing those kinds of things, you are not helping yourself. You're helping others. So at the end of the day, as you were saying before, with picking up this banner, you're picking up a banner, but it's like on false foundation because you're trying to do everything for everyone else and you're trying to make sure that they have the foundation. But how can you help others when you're not helping yourself? It's kind of like, how could you love someone else if you don't love yourself? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like the root of it, you know? Yeah. And I think um, I don't like getting political, but I, I see this a lot in social media right now where people are yeah. burning with so much zeal for whatever cause it is, like fill in the blank cause. And a lot of times that zeal is born from some sort of negative emotion or hurt. And they're using mm -hmm. this outward zeal to further a cause when in reality, which is fine. If someone wants to like make the world a better place, by all means do it. But uh, recognizing where it's coming from, I think is a huge part of that, which is going to uh, avoid the negativity that might come with it. Negativity such as burnout, negativity such as yeah. destruction. I see a lot of good intentions trying to fight for causes, but it's like the most toxic, you know, vicious weapons are coming from people who are trying to make the world a better place. And it's like, yeah. okay, I wonder where this is coming from. And so um, yeah, that aside, exactly. uh, again, I think it's okay to try to validate others and show like, hey, I can do it. So can you. Because that's that's a powerful thing just to make sure, yeah. you know, to, to think about where is it coming from. Um, I... I feel like we uh, are at kind of a good transition point to something else. Uh, I think we've explored this topic, but uh, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. I would love to. So um, there's some other things that we talked about. So we, we can talk about um, the weight gain. Um, we can talk about mm -hmm. uh, the philosophical spirituality stuff, meaning and purpose, existence. Mm -hmm. um, cool. We can talk about some of the other topics of... Um, quitting too early um or anything else that you want to chat about what are you thinking what what was that sentence it kind of quitting, cut out for a second quitting too early i think quitting too early would be cool to talk about but i do very much want to talk about the philosophical stuff i i love talking about that kind of yeah, stuff yeah. It intrigues me a lot so e either or would be it's perfect. your choice you're you're the guest today i, wa I want you to um what? How can I help you? What's going to help you the most? <laughs> yeah. See how I, I it's, again, I'm very self observant. I can see how it's like I'm the one making the choices, but I still want to like have other people do it. You know what I mean? So I'm always like, no, no, it's cool. Like you can do whatever. Yeah. Um, I think talking about the quitting would be cool. Okay. So can you help me understand about what you uh, mean by that? I think it, I think it comes with like the validation portion that we were talking about before, where I always would have these moments of in life where I would like think that I'm quitting too early and too early and thing and I'm never trying hard enough so for example like as we were talking about or as gets mentioned in the question I'll have like climbing benders where I'm climbing like seven days a week and I'll sometimes like do it like two times a day if I'm really feeling bad so for example I route set 
So I'll route set Monday and Wednesday. I'll do my climbing streams Tuesday, Thursday, and then either like a Friday or Saturday. And then because I'm doing that, I never have like client or time to climb on my own. So I'll try and like fill in that Saturday or fill in like that Sunday with climbing. So that means that I'm completely working out and I'm completely rock climbing seven days a week. And then they're like if I'm feeling kind of upset or like I'm not feeling too good, I'll still go to the gym to climb. So that adds like maybe two times a day where I'm like moonboarding in the morning and then I'll come back late at night to like have a climbing session to like try and enjoy myself. Ethan, sorry, I'm a little I bit still, lost. Where is the quitting early part? Because I'm just hearing work so, hard seven days a week. So so the quitting early is like kind of comes from the fact that like I never think I'm doing enough. I've mm. always quit in life or like thought that I've quit in life. So when I was a kid, I would like did baseball and then I wouldn't try hard enough in baseball. I was like the kid in baseball who you would never want on your team because I would sit in the outfield and pick flowers or like <laughs> I was told to do soccer and I'd say st- like st- stuff. I would pick flowers and like run. I like the only goal I ever made in soccer was on my own <laughs> was on my <laughs> own team. Like I was never really like the kid and I would always be like upset by those kinds of things. And those would like kind of make me want to quit because I'd be like, oh, I'm not good enough. So I've always had these like thoughts that like I would always be quitting at things and never like doing enough. And I always have those thoughts come back in. So like with climbing, I still have that feeling in the back of my head that I'm not doing enough. And I know how you were saying before, like it sounds like you're constantly trying. To me, it sounds like I'm not trying enough, Okay, even so though like you. physically I'm doing so much. How did you how did you learn that you weren't doing enough? Because, like, a kid picking flowers during soccer, usually, like, kids aren't very self-aware. They have to be told that something was wrong. So how did you learn that you weren't doing enough? My coach is yelling at me about it. My dad yelling me about it. My mom loved the flowers. She (laughs) she enjoyed the flowers. But but my dad or, or, like, coaches, teachers telling me I would never do homework. I was really bad at doing homework in uh, school because I didn't feel like it would really help me do anything. And at the same time, I wanted to do other things. Um, so like, Ethan, I would always forget. Yeah, can you tell me it. about a time when they told you, like they called you out? I have one very specific memory that like I'll always call back to in conversations with people. In seventh grade, I had like a bender of like not doing my math homework for a month. And my teacher called me out on it after school or after school, after class. She held me back for five minutes. And you have like only five minutes to go in between classes in uh, middle school and high school. So like I had to like go to my next class a little late because she was having this conversation with me. And she was like telling me, why aren't you doing your homework? Why aren't you doing this? Like you got to stop doing this kind of stuff. And I just like couldn't give her a good enough reason because I didn't really want to tell her to her face. I didn't want to do your work. I would like I kind of felt bad about that. But the quote she gave me, if I remember correctly, because I always mix up the words, is excuses are the building blocks to nothing. And when she said that, I was like, oh, <laughs> OK, oh, uh, well, uh, I guess, guess I got to go now. <laughs> See you later. Like that, that kind of hit me really hard that like no matter what I would kind of say. It meant nothing at the end of the day because I'm just giving an excuse for of something, you know, like the, it's not going to help me by just saying, like, why do you not want to do this? Well, this is why I don't want to do it. Well, you should just do it anyway. You know, that was kind of the message that so she was trying to give. That was the message. But how did you feel? I felt very bad. I felt very sad, uh, bad and sad that I, I wasn't really doing the work she was trying to give me because obviously there was good intent behind her she wanted to make sure the kids understood her work and would constantly learn it so that when they come back in class the next day like she could continue on with the lesson because the information that she was trying to teach stuck with the kids like that's the idea of homework in her sense right but obviously i wasn't doing that and i wasn't caring enough so like why was that happening and that kind of made her a little bit upset and i feel like that at the end of the day then made me upset because I wasn't uh, exactly for that reason. I wasn't doing the work that I should have been doing. And at the same time, like, I didn't care enough to do the work. And that kind of made 
me upset because it's like why why don't you care enough you should just do these things you should get good grades you you're obviously like have some sort of intelligence you're obviously self-aware enough so because of that i feel like part of the self-awareness as well that it would make me a little bit upset why didn't you why didn't you care more about the work i i felt like as a kid i had better things to do which wasn't the case at all like i was playing so many video games i was trying to figure out what i wanted to do in life I wanted to figure out like why I was feeling the way I was feeling Uh, because I was also going through anxiety issues at the time. But again, it wasn't verbalized enough or wasn't like, um, what's the word, validated again. I feel like like we're using that word a lot, so I don't want to like constantly use it. Well, I mean, there might be a reason why we're using that, that, you know? There there might be a reason. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. It's it's a little thematic, but uh, I feel like that's where it kind of comes into play. So, hmm. Let me, um, can I think for a second? Yeah, go for it. Ethan, Very are you good enjoying enough? this conversation? Yeah, I'm enjoying uh, it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm so bad with like time, and I didn't think that like the it would go by fast enough but like it's already like almost an hour so yeah cool it's very nice um to what you said before i don't think i am i never think i'm good enough on a general day-to-day basis i don't think i'm trying hard enough or good enough i'm guessing that started as a kid really cemented in there with the coaching the sports Mm -hmm. high school or or middle school where your teacher told you excuses are the billion blocks to nothing and now you have yeah. their voices have been imprinted in your head. And so that's the yeah. current drive forward, right? Yeah. Is that I'm not good enough. So I need to like prove that I'm good enough. But even then, like it, it comes to a point where it's like those victories are kind of hollow because I still feel like I'm not good enough, even though I'm doing pretty okay. I'm doing pretty well. What if I told you I think you're good enough? make me sad <laughs> why does it make you sad because it's it's kind of like uh in the sense that like all these other people see something why can't i see that if if someone else is saying that i'm doing perfect and i'm doing great and i'm doing really good why can't i myself understand that and come to terms with that even if i am doing good enough there's always that like voice in the back of my head that's telling me i'm not doing good enough or like questioning their thoughts like oh they don't know what they're talking about let's let's try so um yeah like what the hell do i know right i'm just i you know barely know you we're just talking for like an hour but (laughs) but let's 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 pivot to uh imagine there's someone else like if i told you about a um what's your height again five six five six yeah, a uh, five six, hundred seventeen pound guy trying to learn to rock climb. He's been at it doing like seven days a week. He is able to. Uh, he's good enough to create his own courses. He's actually been creating a lot of different courses um, at, at the rock climbing gym, and he is possibly pushing himself to the limits. To and he's pretty much uh, you know, on the checklist. He's accomplished a lot of top tier rock climbing routes not everything obviously but there's he's, he's checked off a lot would you say that climber is good enough i would say that that climber is good enough but i also understand the idea of then reflecting it back onto myself to where it's like i could see the objective notes i i could read it and understand it but then when it's like you put my name under it, then that's where it's like, nah, obviously, like, there's something there. Like, I'll either, like, think it's not good enough or I'm not still could do more. It's kind of like when um you see someone who's not, like, climbing. So there's a V scale. So if I just say, like, V, it's it's the level of, say, like, a, a, a way to say, like, someone climbs at a certain level, right? It's the American... Uh, measurement so it starts at v0 goes to v17 right so i climb like hard v8 
around V9. If you want to like equate that to gaming ranks, it would be like really high diamond, right? And I could see someone climbing like V2 and struggling on something V2 and be like, nah, don't even worry, you're doing great. Look at your early technique, like you're showing really good hip movement. Like, don't even worry about it, you're going to do great. But if I know that if I was in that situation, I would be shutting myself down because I know that like I could see that I'm still do I could still do more. I could still really tweak that hip position a little bit more or work on my finger strength a little bit more. There's always like something. It's it's like a, a weird perfectionist route. Are you afraid yeah. of not accomplishing more? Yes, I'm afraid of not doing anything <laughs> at the end of my life. Why are you afraid of not doing anything? Uh, I feel like it comes back to that purpless, purp, purp, purplessness of life. <laughs> where like yeah. I feel like yeah, purplessness of life, where I feel like I'm not doing anything or my life has no meaning. So I want to do as many and as much things as I can in my life. But when you do something physical, your body can only do so much, right? So even if I'm hit my physical limit, I still don't think that I'm quite doing enough. Did you feel invalidated when your teacher told you that excuses uh, amount to are building blocks to nothing? Did you feel invalidated yeah. there? Oh, 100 percent. I definitely did. But it and honestly, it probably wasn't until this conversation that I could be like, oh, yeah, I definitely felt invalidated then because it's kind of just like this one off story that I tell yeah. a lot of people like then bring up like if they're doing excuses right. right but i don't really reflect it back onto myself too much yeah it's, it's difficult it's difficult for us to see this but having someone else to talk to about it which is one of the purposes 100%. of these mental health interviews it it helps us yeah get some outside perspective because uh a lot of times our mind is going to be bubbling up memories on its own for a reason because that emotional trash can overflowing these are the ones that are like taking up the most space or kind of, you know, flow into the yeah, top exactly. first. So, cause basically I'm just seeing this, this theme of, uh, one, you're running, running away from the motions. Hence you're, you're going to the rock climbing. And the other one is you're afraid of not accomplishing more. And that Genesis, it sounds like we're seeing the theme of your childhood. You were told and many times you're not doing enough. And you were mm -hmm. not valid as a person. And those two combined, that's a hell of a drug to keep pushing you forward. Because Very much so. if you don't do enough, if you don't keep pushing, you're invalid. Like you're not, uh -huh. you're not worth, you don't have worth. Yeah. You're not good enough. And yeah. um, we can still, so here, now we can kind of uh, transition over to philosophical spirituality stuff. Because this actually ties together nicely. Ooh. Uh, which, transition. Yeah, which might be also a uh, a breath of fresh air. The I'm going to share about myself, if that's okay, and my beliefs. Please. So uh, yeah. I, I know you're agnostic. I I'm Christian, and um, mm -hmm. I what I'm going to say, I know it's going to offend people. He's talking about God, but mm -hmm. I'll be speaking from my experience on this, mm -hmm. and um, it, it can still apply to other people. Which is yeah. um, my, my belief in Christianity and God. So like a lot of people, they'll, they'll hear about how uh, the fire and brimstone version of God, which is if you are like you don't do well, then you're going to get punished. Like you sin or you're going to hell, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I do not subscribe to that at all. I, I think um, th the version of Christianity that... I believe in, when I say version, I mean my interpretation of reading the scripture in the Bible and like seeing how it all ties together is the saved by grace. So there's, so generally speaking, among the Christians, uh, among Protestants, because I, I should say, like to give more history, among Christians, there's Catholics, Protestants, and Eastern Orthodox. And so among, I'm Protestant, um, among the Protestants, generally speaking, there's, there's two groups about salvation. One is um, fire and brimstone. Basically, you have to perform. And if you don't perform, then you're going to get punished. You got to go confess your sins, blah, 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 blah. And then there's a saved by grace. Yeah, I'm in the saved by grace, which is Jesus died for what us once to forgive everything. Clean slate. We're done forever. That is mm -hmm. um, once saved, always saved. There's another way to, to look at it. So basically my performance and my behavior doesn't matter. It, I, I'm not trying to say that like in an existential way. It's just if I um, 
if I don't perform, it doesn't matter. I don't yeah. have to perform to please God. God is already pleased. Therefore, I can go do good stuff. So this ties God. in. Here's how it ties in. So the identity, um, if like you watch Dr. K's content too, right? hundred percent. All you know, the time. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. You know, he talks about like the physical yeah. body and then our mind and then like there's the spirit, yeah. right? Uh, mm -hmm. He doesn't outright say it, but this is very similar to um, uh, my belief mm -hmm. system is actually very similar to what he's described in terms of the human, which mm -hmm. is we have our physical body. We have the mind where like all our emotions are. And then we can take another step back. And then there is who we are. We are us. We are observing the mind. Therefore, we are not our mind, right? Like, oh, my mind is going crazy mm -hmm. right now. I'm getting all these bad things from my mind. So because we're talking about it as a third person, that means we have yet another layer of existence, which Mm -hmm. In my belief system is the spirit. I don't think he specifically calls it the spirit, but that idea of the spirit. And so a lot of my relief as a human, um, my spiritual belief is that when Jesus died, my spirit. So uh, this is, again, the my interpretation of read the scripture is there's an identity yeah, swap that my identity is as if I am Jesus, which sounds so like heretical, but it's God views me <laughs> yeah. as perfect. Even though yeah. my spirit, my, my, my mind and my, my body are not perfect in God's eyes. That, that was the whole thing with Jesus. So that's, that's the whole like saved by grace um, idea. And so what this manifests into like, let me, let me bring it back down to the practical stuff, uh, which is I am good enough. Therefore, I can do X, Y, Z. It's not I am going to do X. I'm going to do more rock climbing so I can be good enough. It's I am good enough. So I'm going to do more rock climbing. I am perfect, so therefore, I'm going to go and accomplish some great stuff. Not, I'm going to accomplish some great stuff, so I am perfect. So you, you see the difference? That whole yeah. upside-down stuff, it, it, it's completely backwards. And this, this spirituality, uh, philosophical stuff that we're talking about doesn't necessarily require um, uh, God or, or Jesus to be in the picture here. Although I think, you know, just um, to talk about it from my own perspective— having that as like a higher authority is validating me like a perfect authority is validating me because if i believe in jesus therefore i have perfect identity that that to me makes it a little bit more powerful but still the same motivation can apply to people to where if you start with the belief and acceptance that you are good enough that is relieving that is yeah. that frees you from so much chains and bondage and baggage and that frees you to go do more and to go be like negative emotion free to be your best self and go be a kick-ass rock climber and to go carry a banner to help validate other people who feel invalidated because they are just not the right body type to do rock climbing. Yeah. What do you think about all that? I think, well, there's a lot to pull from it, to be honest. I, do do yeah. you uh, read philosophical books by any chance? Not a lot, but I am mildly familiar with a few different, you know, philosophies. Okay. So, so there's, I was recommended this book by my psychiatrist. Uh, it's, uh, hold up, I can pull, uh, it doesn't matter what, exactly what the name is, but the, the re or the author is Eckhart Tolle, right? And he talks a lot about the idea of connecting yourself with your spiritual self. So again, I'm agnostic. I was raised Jewish. So I have like a lot of roots in like actual practical religion. But the idea like that you're talking before about this mind, body, spirit connection, he talks about when you're because I've never really truly meditated. I've only done like mindfulness apps, like not actual meditation, but kind of like this way to try and figure out your thoughts. And that never really helped. But the first chapter in this book helped me way more than anything I've ever done in terms of the idea of like figuring out your brain to like try and decode your thoughts a little bit. And he was saying that just if you can think your thoughts, right, and you're letting your thoughts run by and you could observe your own thoughts, that means that there has to be a separate level of consciousness besides the one that you currently have. So there has to be something a little bit more than the mind and the body. There has to be something more. Yep. So what you say, spirit, I might say is just deeper consciousness. Sure. Yeah. But this idea, this idea that if I can observe my own thoughts and allow my thoughts to run, then creates this separate space. Like if this was your mind, 
then on the outside layer of your mind, you can observe those thoughts and try and figure out those thoughts. And when you currently are observing the thoughts and letting them run, not observing the thoughts in the sense of like you then start overthinking and start becoming the thoughts, but just allowing the thoughts to run, there's this moment of stillness. And that's what the theoretical idea of nirvana is, right? This idea of eternal peace. So when you're talking about to become good enough, that's that what I want to obtain, but it seems so unobtainable for me. And I don't know why in a sense. I feel like I have issues with the idea of perfect. And that comes with a lot of things where it's like I want to become perfect, but at the same time, I never think that I'll be perfect. But at the same time, I also don't believe in the idea that things can be perfect. So when good enough also doesn't sound like I to to use the word itself, good enough doesn't sound good enough. <laughs> it seems like there should be something a little bit more, right? That you, you, this level that that you obtain all nirvana is the best way to describe it this peacefulness with your own existence the idea that you can just exist there's nothing really to prove at the end of the day my my guess is you um you're gonna have a hard time achieving that as long as that thought generator is in your head about being invalid and being pointless and i think recognizing like if you go through this exercise of why am i feeling like this Why, why do i feel like i am not good enough what i feel like i have to push more well i feel like that because if i don't push more then i'm not good enough where does that come from when did mm-hmm. it start and you start back back tracing every time and if you can start to recognize that this starts with you know like i was um you know in high school and i felt invalid or like i was picking flowers and the coaching and stuff like that the coaches were telling me that i need to do more or whatever uh when you start mm-hmm. recognizing that that can start freeing you from it and i think freeing you from those negative emotions will allow for you to become more positive. What are you feeling right now? It's hard to describe. When I when I get into these kinds of conversations, it it feels like I'm like a kid. Like when you start learning things again or start like learning new things, right? Like playing Minecraft for the first time is like yeah. the best thing that I always oh, like yeah. try and like pull back to. I like bought Minecraft in the beta, so I bought it for $5. Way yeah, way back. I'm talking like 2011 right i'm i bought it like that's where like that middle school start right of like buying something for the first time and like playing that game for the first time and you start to like feel all these new things start learning i like learned how windrar worked and like the idea of modding things and like breaking down files because of that game and starting to just like constantly learn that's like the feeling i'm feeling of just like i'm learning and I very much like that feeling, and I like to constantly chase that feeling. But again, I feel like there's like some sort of negative background behind it of constantly trying to chase that. If that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think that's going to take, you know, I'm glad you're getting therapy because this might be something uh, worth talking about. Yeah, because I, <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. I think like teasing that apart, and of course, right, it could be a mixed bag of things. But um, I think moving towards a place where you feel good enough and you feel like you have purpose is yeah. um, ultimately that is the right place to move towards. I think um, it's because it's, it's very freeing. And, and, you know, I'll draw some parallels with church because I see a lot of um, uh, folks in church uh, church where they have a lot of emotional baggage from other churches that were fire and brimstone about basically telling you're not good enough. God's angry at you, blah, 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 all that stuff. Um, I think that caused a lot of emotional damage and that we probably heard many stories, people like that. And so when they come to a different church, that's like a saved by grace church that basically says like, you are good enough. Like God's pleased with you just as you are. It's very hard for them to accept. And it takes a lot of time to replace that voice in their head. So that, um, that could be uh, a combination of things like the therapy, recognize where it comes from. Also just replacing that voice in your head in a community mm-hmm. of people who are validating you. If you get enough people validating you in your life, that could also be really good. Uh, I, I don't know. What's your like day-to-day life like? Community, social circle, that kind of stuff. 
Well, lately it's been very isolating, not just because of COVID, but also because of like a lot of the people who. So I, I have a very like detached feeling with my family. I don't want to per se say anything like super negative about it, but I don't feel like very, uh, the best way to describe it is like if my family wasn't my family, I probably wouldn't be hanging out with them just because we are very separate individuals and we are very different in the way that we think, right? So when I went to college, I met people who um very like we I would consider my family. These some friends of mine who I very very much think are like just near and dear to my heart. Right? And because of me meeting them in college, there is like a separation or a separation, an understanding that we all are from different places, right? Some of them are really far north in New York, where it's like a nine hour drive. Some are like a lot farther, some are in this New York City. So we're all spread out. So that idea of like finding such a close knit community that I would call truly my family and then being like super dispersed from them. Very hard for me to try and like get as social as I want to be because I start like overthinking about that. So, for example, I was talking about way before that I had like a, a recent under where I like lost a lot of weight really quickly. That happened like a couple of weeks ago. The catalyst of that was revisiting my friends again and seeing that like people I would call my family again and under like having this like mental rut, like right in my face of understanding that like time is finite and that I can't always see my friends every say every single moment. And having them all here join together, I was so happy and excited that the second I left, it kind of like came crashing down, understanding like how sad I was about everything, being like, oh, well, my time's finite. I'm growing older now. I constantly call myself old, even though I'm really only like 23, which is a very bad habit of mine. And I feel really bad saying that around like a lot of people. But like all those things kind of like came flushing into my head and then I started to have like a throwing up episode and I started to get super anxious. And it was around that time that I went on Lexapro because I realized how bad my anxiety was and I kind of needed a way to like calm down the thought cycles that I would have and those thought loops that I would have so that I can then start to like progress onward from here. If that makes sense. Mm hmm. Yeah, I always feel bad about saying the age thing because I feel like that's a problem that I will eternally have. That's yeah. something that like no matter what age I am, whether I'm like 12 or whether I'm then going to be like 99, I will always call myself old. But that's just because as finite beings, we're very aware of our like frug frugality and our brevity. Like we will always be become aging. We're at the end of the day, meant, meant to die is a very <laughs> nihilistic way to look at it. Yeah. But it's kind of, that's ending up how I end up looking at it. Yeah. I mean, that sounds, that, that does sound like it adds to the, to the pointlessness feeling. And, yeah. Um, I, I look at it from a different way, which is, I don't know, I stopped paying attention to age. When did I start, stop paying attention to age? Obviously, like, what does it say, like 21, 25 or whatever? Um, I stopped paying attention to it. My life also was uh, slowing down in terms of wasn't radically changing every couple of years. Cause like when you're in college or school, like your life radically is changing constantly. Once you settle down to like mm -hmm. career, then your job or whatever, then it stops changing so much. I kind of stopped thinking about it then about how old I am. Cause like I'm actually turning 36 next month and yeah. I forget, I actually, I legitimately forget how old I am. And I have to ask my wife, Helen, <laughs> like, was. how old am I? I'm yeah. 30, 35, right? I don't remember. I actually have a yeah. command for it in chat, exclamation mark stats. I actually use that because I need to remember sometimes. <laughs> Dude, that's I stop. incredible. I stop forget. I, I, I forget. And so, um, but, but part of that too is... Um, <laughs> See it now. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Part of that too is <laughs> I feel relief that my belief in I am good enough Right, and that's that's rooted in, in the God stuff, but uh, that also by I didn't have too much, I guess, psychological baggage growing up about not being good enough. Uh, you know, I, I don't have to think about that. <laughs> I, I, there's probably little places here and there where, but I didn't have what a lot of other people typically have, where they don't feel good enough in terms of mm -hmm. they have some, like a lot of 
um, series of reinforcement that they're not good enough. And so I, I never had that. And so I always felt kind of good enough. And then uh, believing in it more and more in my 20s, um, I generally believe I'm, I, I am good enough. And not that nothing matters, but it's more like I can't screw up. I have the belief yeah. that in the big picture of things, I cannot screw up. Now, obviously, I can make micro mistakes, like things I regret some drama mm -hmm. saying the wrong thing yes absolutely i still have those but when i sit down and really just like you know think about it mm, you know i really believe like it's all gonna be okay it's all like i have a purpose i have an identity and nothing can change that that's that's my belief and so i just yeah let's let's go life let's let's just go let's see where things are gonna go it's a beautiful outlook yeah i just it feels so it feels so unobtainable at least for me which is so odd I, yeah. I know I've been trying very hard not to pay attention to chat, but someone said something very good in chat that I relate to. Yeah. Where someone ahead. said that he probably feels, let me, Bloodsport said this, uh -huh. where maybe uh, I don't feel old because he never expected to live to 23 to begin with. That's 100% true. I, I, I constantly never thought that I would make it past the ages that I would make it. I never thought I would make it past 16. That was like the big milestone for me, was hitting 16. I just never thought that I would like get to that point or I felt like I would come crashing down before I got to that point. So as I constantly age, it's like this odd feeling of mortality that I constantly attach to. So, but at the same time, it's like, oh, kind of made it, you know? So Ethan, when did you start learning that you weren't going to make it? As I started to get really rooted in my thoughts of emptiness as a kid i would say it started I, it feels weird because i always like bring back probably like 13 ish where i like had these moments where i would go to my dad's office whenever i'd have like off in school and i would just like be sitting there playing video games just like in his office alone i don't know why those specific memories are the ones that like i relate to so much but i like v very vividly remember like sitting on my computer playing smite and just like thinking about like what is the purpose of like me doing this like why am i doing this and then having these existential thoughts at such a young age kind of puts a little bit of a toll on you when you are very self-observant and aware of what's going on around you that it i don't know why in like particular that like those are the ones that i think about but i just remember like ranting to online friends about what's the point why am i doing this what's going on and having that like escape of being able to just rant to some people online because I never felt like I could tell people in real life those kinds of things. It wasn't until college where I met those people who are like very near and dear to me that I would be able to like truly let go. Or And even then, there was still some like holding back of these feelings of how I always felt in terms of like let understanding that like I'm very sad about the way things are in life. Ethan, how did you start or when, I mean, we talked about when it was, you know, you're playing Smite mm -hmm. in your dad's office, but how did you learn that you weren't going to make it? It's kind of hard to like register. It's almost like I under, and, and I feel like it's a very, um, very odd way to like think about it but i was very self-observant with my own thoughts that like as i'm going about day-to-day -day conversations with people i start to realize and it's a very sad way to look at it that I was like there was something wrong with me it's like the way i would describe it it was like why are people so okay with everything going on about life how are people so fine with things that are happening right now, right? And just living. And I was so sad and upset by like a lot of these things that I would like start to think that like, I'm not gonna make, like I'm not gonna be able to survive constantly these thoughts in my own head. I'm not gonna be able to come to terms and rationalize with what's going on in my head right now. That I'm probably gonna do some something really stupid, right? 
a lot of people who I ended up looking up to as a kid, which is kind of sad to think about. A lot of my favorite music artists, a lot of my favorite artists in general are not alive anymore because of those kinds of things. That is kind of like, I see that the people who most certainly think like me, this is what's happened to them. So it's eventually going to happen to me. So I think that might explain a lot. That as a kid, you learned yeah. your heroes were dying. <laughs> yeah. If my heroes are dying, yeah. what's going to happen to me? So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I could totally see uh, a connection there. And that that in itself also feels like a samskar, you know, like a, an emotional bit of baggage, kind of realizing that dread as a kid. Um, I think that's also something worth exploring for yourself to see where these feelings of, of dread come from. Um, mm -hmm. We've been talking for a while, a good hour and a half. Uh, I've enjoyed this conversation too, but I was wondering oh, I love what, what else would you uh, want to talk about? The only thing I have written down on my list is talking about weight gain and food, but is there any other topics that you wanted to touch on or like, or revisit? Um, here, let me look. Cause I, I sent you a note about, uh, what I wanted to talk about. Cause again, I, I, I get on tangents whenever I talk, I kind of just ramble really hard and then it kind of steers away from what my original points of topics were. So let me just read really quick. Maybe trying to like go into the fact of using this passion, if, if that's what we want to call it as a coping mechanism to like truly figure out I don't know, even know how to describe it. like why I'm constantly trying to prove something in a sense like I'm climbing so much like these last two days I'm forcibly taking a break because I've been climbing every single day my maximum streak of climbing every single day was about 128 days it was last summer of just climbing every single day the reason I stopped climbing was because I got sick and I had to take, because I went away on a climbing trip, I had to take a flight home from West Virginia to Chicago and then Chicago to New York. And I got laid over in Chicago. So I physically could not climb that day because I was stuck. So like trying to get out of these habits of like not being good enough or per se, those are the feelings that I'm thinking of not being good enough and trying to calm down on the benders, understanding that like rest is good. I can verbally say these things, but it's very hard for me to come to terms with and then actually practice. Yeah. So like these last two days, I've been forcibly taking a two day break because I'm going to end up dreaming and climbing tomorrow for a long time. So my Ethan, fingers are getting a little messed up. Do you feel <laughs> like while yeah. you're taking this break, do you feel like I think tying it back together? Do you feel like invalidated and feel not good enough because you're taking a break? I I don't know if I feel not validated, but I definitely feel like I'm not trying. I feel like I'm not doing good enough. Yeah. I feel like I'm uh, like I should be climbing. I should be trying to get stronger. I should be at least doing something. Yeah. But and I think this all ties back into what we talked about earlier, which is my hypothesis is you learned at an early age that you weren't good enough, that you need to keep trying yeah. harder. You felt invalidated. People didn't believe in you. And so you had to that, that, I mean, that you just those voices were basically imprinted in your head. So as a result, you can't take breaks. You have to keep yeah. trying. It also at the same time as a result, you're running away from these emotions by busying yourself because you don't want to be thinking about the anxiety. You don't want to be thinking about the future. And you busy yourself with the rock climbing. So you just you can't you can't not take a break. And at the same time, yeah. it's also a positive thing because you're helping lots of people. You're um helping uh people by creating routes it's it's a positive impact to like just build stuff with your hands mm -hmm. um all of those things are fantastic and you're standing up for other people who you know the, the people who are uh too short or they don't have the right body type um i think it's a mixed bag of things yeah. but that's that's kind of the extent of my hypothesis i think that's why for your passion um, it's, it's a passion that functions as multiple things. It, it's, it's mm -hmm. protecting you from the past and those emotions. 
and it's also fueled by you know you gotta you gotta keep trying because you learned you were at a young age you gotta keep trying you're not good enough you got you're invalidated so um what are your thoughts on that i completely agree i feel like for me to truly figure out what goes on in my head there's a lot of wires that need to be untangled there are so many things that i end up like amalgamating into one issue that like there's actually multiple issues and there's actually multiple things that are going on in my head that i need to like truly figure out it's not just at the end of the day that i don't feel good enough why don't i feel good enough and then there's like so many other things that like root into it and it's going to take a lot for me to truly figure it out but i need to be able to physically practice it before i can mentally practice it I need to be able to like come to terms with the idea of rest and the idea that like at the end of the day, if you want to become a stronger climber, you don't climb seven days a week. Yeah, you could, but you need to actually rest. You need to let your body heal and recover or else it's just going to get injured at the end of the day. Yep. I'm currently going through like a semi volume issue uh, injury. It's not like an injury per se, but it could very much lead to an injury. I don't know if you could see it per se, but my this middle finger is much more swollen than this middle oh, finger. Oh, yeah, I see that now. The It is, however, the swelling has gone down a lot. It has really, Whoa. really gone down a lot. But the reason of that swelling is from, uh, I, I feel like I, I use the word embiotic fluid, but I know that's not the exact word. But I know that, like, within your joints, there's fluid that actually holds your tendons together, right? So your tendons are wrapped or extremely complicated in your fingers. There are, like, uh, PTs specifically dedicated to climbers because of how intricate the hand is in terms of the multiple muscles and multiple tendons that run it, right? So I'm probably going through, like, a, like a, the tendons that are between my A, I think it's A1 and A2 pulleys. If not, I think it's A3 and 4. So it's the pulley that is right here, right? That pulley system has been so overused, in particular by the moon board, because it's an extremely finger-intensive workout. It's on a 40-degree angle wall, as well as it's like symbiotic fluid. That's the word. <laughs> exactly. Symbi symbiotic fluid is the word. I think it's synovial I don't fluid, say, but I might be wrong. Synovial fluid. It I is might be wrong bad. in my so bad. Embiotic fluid is the thing that when you have a baby. Yeah, I was about to say. I, I don't think, know, I don't now, think like, you're going to have embiotic fluid in you, fluid. but I mean, yeah, I have I baby I'm fluid in you, my finger. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my bad. I'm so bad with that kind of stuff. I, my pronunciation is so bad, even though like English is my first language. Yeah, I think same gibberish here. is the first technical, one. Technical words like that, I often get wrong. Like, yeah. I used to call like aluminum, oh, al al aluminum or something like that until Helen, <laughs> until Helen laughed laughed it out of me and yeah. made fun of me so much that I've, uh, you know, anyway, whatever. Some past <laughs> trauma I need to deal with myself. Anyway, but anyway go on. My, my biggest one is, e the word is even. I say even. And you'll notice oh, that a yeah. lot throughout the conversation. I say like it doesn't even matter. It just like kind of just rolls off my tongue. Well, anyway, yeah. um, that's like a stressor that I need to work on. It's like yeah. that injury currently is not like there isn't a specific injury. My tendon isn't pulled as well as like there isn't anything going on with the actual joint muscle. It's just that I've been climbing so much that it's slowly, slowly swelling up. And I've been talking to a friend of mine who's like giving me a workout regimen because he's a PT and he is a heavy climber. So I've never worked out a day in my I mean, I've worked out like very uh, sporadically in life, but I've never like worked out. So I'm slowly starting to do a workout routine. It's been over a month where I'll do two days uh, every week of a 20 minute workout that's focusing on my shoulders, biceps, really like my lock off strength. So the ability to go from here take that muscle, lock it, and then pull really hard from those positions. Because I'm a very powerful climber, but I'm not a strong climber. Yeah. So, so to be able to work on those kinds of things. I, I was, yeah, I know. I've got, I've got a tangent. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to interrupt. Because uh, yep. I, I hypothesize, because I think I've collected enough data, I hypothesize it's difficult for you to take the rest because of these thought loop generators that you learned, right? those sound scars, yeah. as a kid. That you got to keep pushing hard. And so rest is not built yeah. in. And so you're having to relearn that. And I bet you have negative emotions that don't let you rest and you feel bad and possibly beat yourself up or tell yourself you're not doing enough when you're resting. But you know, logically, you need to rest. You need rest days, right? And you have this 100%. internal battle. Yeah. So 
uh, I don't want to like unlearn anything we learned earlier because I think this is all tied together. It's the same thing, which is oh, you, you're, you're going to have to go back to explore where this all comes from. When did it start? Start unpacking that and recognizing that these negative emotions you feel today is driven from that stuff in the past. Um, yeah. Is uh, the only other thing to talk about, I, I think, because I, I don't want to like rehash too much of what we've already talked about unless there's something uh, oh, a new aspect to it. Um well, there are a topic then would be weight gain, right? Eating more food. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll give you the quick um quick summary secret trick to eat more food. Uh it's really gonna come yeah. down to um one is obviously intention and awareness. You gotta think about do, actually doing it and kind of plan it out sometimes. But more importantly, choosing palatable foods. What kinds of foods mm -hmm. do you typically eat? Soup. <laughs> I love soup. What kind of soup? That's probably like my most consistent, like any soup. I'm really, bro, Campbell's chicken and herb dumplings, the creamy one, is like by far my favorite soup of like all time. But I've been eating a lot of consistent, just bland chicken noodle soup because I've been still very worried about my stomach. I'm trying to get over the anxiousness. Um, but so I'm really is, like not a picky. Is the chicken noodle soup easier on your stomach than like? The cream of mushroom or whatever. It's not like it's easier, but it feels more normal in a sense, or like okay. comfortable, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like, um, I, yeah. Go ahead. I was gonna say I get anxious very weirdly about food, and it's like never very rooted in anything. But like, I might just like, let's say like I eat something like minestrone, right? And then I happen to vomit from external reasons involving anxiety. I will then connect in my head the link between those two things of the food. And then I'll immediately assume it's the food and it wasn't the anxiety. Okay. And then it's hard for me to go back into that. Yeah, that's going to be tough to undo. But um, what's what's good is we can still whatever foods you like, we can still work with it. So it is. Um, like dealing with the physical manifestation of, of stress starving. We already talked about that. And um, I would implement those techniques if you can. The other aspect of it is palatability of food. So if you're, you're um, well, let's take the example of the cream of mushroom soup or cream of chicken, whatever it was, you're okay with eating that. Right. And you find it enjoyable. Right. Yeah. So in the category of soup, how can we, can we make it more calorie dense and more palatable? How can we combo things to make it taste better? So, Calorie dense, obviously the minestrone soup versus the cream of chicken. The minestrone is calorie light because there's a lot of vegetables. It's a watery soup. It's water based versus the cream of chicken. It, you know, it, basically the whiter it is, it's, the more creamy it is, it's going to be um, more calorie dense because it's basically a, a dairy based um, soup as opposed to a um, a water based one. So go, the calorie mm -hmm. dense stuff is going to come from the creamy soup. So if you enjoy creamy soups, go for that. That's going to be already denser. Now, how can we improve it so you can mm. eat more and get more calories in? We can make it more palatable. What is there to palatability? There's obviously taste and flavor. There's texture. Mm. There's mixing things up and, and changing um, what's going to go into your mouth. So let's take, for example, um, pizza. Um, Stefan, I'll do a quick shout out to Stefan Guillenet, which I'll type his name in chat. Uh, Stefan... S T E P H A N. Yeah. yeah. G N A G U Y E N E T. Uh, he talks a lot about uh, palatability of food. And one of the examples he gives is pizza. How if you deconstruct a pizza into its individual components dough, um, uh, dough, pizza sauce, cheese, pepperoni, just those four components, if you were to eat those one at a time individually, it would be disgusting and we would not eat nearly as much, but you put mm -hmm. it together. It magically tastes so much better and it is so much easier for us to pack down way more calories and eat way more because the palatability improves and increases. So the same thing could be said for something like, let's look at a sandwich. Uh, if you go to Subway, I actually like Subway, not sponsored, but I, I enjoy it. Uh, typical Subway meal, straight. Subway sandwich plus chips plus a soda. So you look at all three of those, we're talking about obesity um, and the obesity epidemic. One of the things is palatability of food has increased and like restaurants know this. 
fast food knows this, how to make things taste better, get us to eat more and consume more. You have the sandwich. What are the flavors there? We have savory. We have carbs. We have the the protein. It's um, usually going to be kind of fatty because we have, uh, if we put mayo or some sort of sauce on there, it's uh, also going to have some crunch to it, a little bit of, you know, fruits and vegetables, or not fruits, but vegetables in there. That's going to uh, mix things up a little bit, right? That's the sandwich. And then the chips is usually salty, oily, uh, crunchy. So it's adding a different texture, different uh, flavor palette. And then the soda. What's the soda? It's liquid. We're drinking it. It's sweet. Every one of those is cleansing the palate from the other. They're so different and so unique. It makes it so much easier to eat more. Because I take a bite of the sandwich yeah. and get kind of tired of it. The chips, oh, the chips taste so much better. I wash it down with the soda. My palate is cleansed. The chips taste even better now. Because if you just eat a straight bag of chips and then drink a soda by itself, sequentially in series like that, you're going to consume way less because your palate's going to get less excited and get bored of the chips if you force yourself to do it in sequence like that. But if you mix it together and you alternate from one to the other, man, it tastes so good and you can get so much more food in. And so I apply these techniques when I'm bulking, I'm getting sick of food, I'm eating healthy, generally healthy food and I want to just keep eating more. But I, 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 I sorry, I want to stop eating. I'm just getting sick of eating more. And so Mixing it up with palatability is going to improve it. So I'll give you another example that I give often, which is tamales. I like tamales, um, which for those who don't know, it's a, it's a Mexican dish. It's basically a, um, yeah. um, a think of a burrito, but it's got a filling, usually just like a meat filling. And it's it's uh, wrapped in corn instead of a tortilla. Like it's just it, it's it's like a corn uh, corn meal type of thing. So, yeah, basically it's carbs Incredible. and meat. Yeah, they're great. I like them. Yeah. And one time I was eating. I just like, I was having some tamales and like my drink was water. Two bites in, I was like, oh God, I feel so full. I, I know, I knew not, not full, but I'm not motivated to eat this. I know I'm not going to make it. I'm yeah. not going to be able to finish this. It was like 700 calories of tamales plus water. So what did I do? Palatability. I added some Greek yogurt on top of it to make it like sour cream. And then I added cheese. Mm. So those two combined, I'm adding more calories. I made it more palatable. It was easier to eat. And I added hot sauce too. I always add hot sauce. And then I swapped out my water gotcha. for a soda. I took my 700 calorie meal, bumped it up to like 11, 1200 calories, and it was easier to eat. So that's the magic of palatability and how we can use that to okay. eat more. We're not eating enough. And so for your sake, let's take this example now, apply it to soup. What can we do with the cream of mushroom soup and make it taste better? Can you add bread? Do you like dipping bread in there? Yeah. Crackers? Something in particular that I've been doing mm -hmm. is that, um, because again, I've been, I really have like a huge issue with eating breakfast in particular. And I know I've been trying to eat a lot more specifically because of medicine, but also just to like get proper protein intake my uh, the head route setter that i work with he is also on uh the same medication as me and he's also been on this medication before he's doing it again for having like more anxiety issues popping up and something that he's specifically doing is as you mentioned before with hot sauce i love hot sauce so he's saying that every morning if he has like eggs he'll douse his eggs in hot sauce and i usually don't like eggs i have a tendency to like eggs but it, as you were saying before it's that palate i start to like not like it as i keep going on so what i do is like i'll add an english muffin with it i'll add some like spinach in the eggs and i'll throw on like a lot like i'm talking about like a lot of hot sauce yeah on the eggs and that kind of makes it a lot easier to eat and like get it down really quickly yeah and thinking about your food and basically for lack of a better term making it more exciting and taste better is the way yeah. to go. And a lot of times we can add more stuff to make it taste better. So like soup, if I were to try to gain more weight off of soup, which soup, it really isn't the most ideal, but the cream mushroom soup, for example, um, mm. adding crackers, adding bread, you're adding, you're adding a new texture, a new palate. You're kind of changing it up because it's just taking bites of the yeah. soup. You use the bread to dip it in there, get a bread bowl. You're adding in more food and changing up the flavor. Can you add in different proteins? Can you add in, um, another aspect is the calorie dense fats. Fat, high fat food for most people is going to help you eat more calories because it tends to be more palatable. So higher fat content stuff. Also the soup, this, the cream and mushroom soup as an example is higher fat than the minestrone, which is going to make it taste better and get you more calories for um, the same volume of food. So um, that's the kind of concept. Do you have any other types of uh, foods you want to explore in terms of making more palatable or increasing the calories of it? 
I think I need to just get better at eating because I'll always have like uh I never really like to go grocery shopping I'll kind of just like get whatever I look at and then kind of snack and like get through from that but I need to get better at creating meals so I know meal prep is a huge thing in general and that's something I very much so need to start doing so I just never started um exclamation mark meal prep domination time.com slash meal prep (laughs) perfect segue I have a uh, section I I divide up my meals by calorie light calorie moderate and calorie dense you sir should Mm -hmm. probably meal prep from the calorie dense section because that stuff Mm -hmm. is tasty lots of calories and it's not that filling meaning it's going to be easier to pack down the calories it's i I don't know if uh it's it's cheap i don't know if you're trying to save money but that's another aspect Mm -hmm. too it's very affordable it's like two dollars a meal and it's freezable so you could mass produce a lot at once um to give an example let me um let me just pull up one of them now no please um for calorie dense and talk about why it might be kind of calorie dense do you have any questions about the calorie dense stuff um my so my biggest thing because i feel like it comes more with like stigmas within the climbing community about achieving the perfect level of strength to weight ratio you try not to gain a lot of weight because you want to be low weight more weight means more uh force load on your fingers or more load of force on your fingers and you want to try and keep yourself on the lighter side so you don't mess up your fingers as much but at the same time you want to have as much strength as possible per weight so i'm always worried about gaining too much weight but at the same time i know it's something that's important in order to gain muscle mass are you competing? i'm always worried about i'm not competing so it's not something i'm worried about but so, I want to get better at route setting. In order to get better at route setting, I need to be stronger. And I want to com- like technically route set on a competitive level. So I want to be able to make problems for the competition. Yeah. Ethan, so I think I, letting go and accepting failure is very liberating. And what I mean by that yeah. is bulking up and making mistakes and accepting the mistakes and not really having a lot of serious consequences from it. Um that's very freeing to see that you can fail and be okay. So a quick mm-hmm. example is dirty bulking. Uh, I don't recommend dirty bulking, but at the same time, it can be very uh, a very good learning tool to screw up. And I did that too. My first bulk. Uh, dirty bulking, I gained really way too much weight unnecessarily, but it felt good to see what it's like and to actually push myself past those limits to see what the opposite extreme is. Uh, can you explain so, what dirty bulking is? Yeah, yeah. So a proper bulk or like clean bulk, lean bulk is you would gain weight at a slow controlled rate of like, you know, half a pound to a pound per week, broadly speaking. Okay. And the reason why you would do that is because you want to build muscle, but unfortunately you're going to build fat too because you have to be at a calorie surplus. So you yeah. have to gain some weight and some fat gains inevitable, but you don't want to gain too much too fast because there's a finite amount of muscle mass your body can synthesize on a daily, weekly basis. So therefore, okay. you want to supply yourself with enough calories to gain weight to maximize muscle gain, but not so much that you're putting on necessary fat. Because if you just if you gain one pound per week, you're probably going to maximize muscle gain. Um, but if you gain two pounds per week, you're not really going to improve your muscle gain at all. You're going to be just gain, the rest mm-hmm. will just go to fat. So it's kind of unnecessary to gain too fast. You want to just go slow, slow Completely control. Completely understand that. Though. And so making the mistake of gaining too much and putting on too much body fat can be a uh, very liberating and almost make that making that mistake for you, Ethan, can free you from the anxiety of, oh, what if I screw up or whatever? Just screw up. You're not competing. There's not much on the line here is what I'm understanding. Yeah. So um, now I'm not saying go gain three pounds per week, but... Uh, you know, let's find something in the middle because I think naturally you're yeah. always going to be fighting against too much weight gain. And so you letting go would be, I'm going to gain, instead of gaining a quarter pound, I'm going to let go and gain one pound per week. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you're probably going to end up aiming for a reasonable, um, moderate amount knowing your personality type. So yeah. I, I think that should be one of your attitudes. Yes. You're afraid of gaining too much weight, but make that mistake. Make that mistake yeah. once. See what it's like. Because you know, on a very practical note, you will be stronger, right? You're going to be stronger. Maybe your strength yeah. to weight ratio won't be the same, but that you can kind of navigate. And it's it can be very helpful and a, a good learning tool for you 
as a rock climber who might become an expert one day at this to know what it's like to be on the other end of the spectrum because yeah when i was on the other end of the spectrum of you know dirty bulking just bulking too much i learned what that was like and i know what that feels like and now i'm like oh okay now i, I can relate to that more and i've i've been there done that it's an experience exactly so uh don't don't be afraid of that is basically what i'm saying um yeah the uh food um uh, i want to show some pictures of this of the food here we this is the taco yeah. baked ca casserole so this one is basically like um this is a casserole basically it's pasta with meat <laughs> yeah go for the fatty cuts of meat right ground beef yeah. go for the fatty cuts because it's gonna be cheaper and more palatable easier to put down more calories layered with more more pasta and cheese and salsa i love hot sauce i love spicy salsa yeah. makes it easier to put down you want to add more calories on top of this get a side of some greek yogurt full fat greek yogurt mm. have it as a side occasionally use that to make it even more palatable and even more calories so that's the taco baked casserole this is all under exclamation mark meal prep uh bacon chorizo breakfast burritos one of my favorites um basically we deconstruct it it's just a tortilla with cheese chorizo which is basically pork very um delicious pork yeah. um, ground pork a little bit of potatoes add some carbs in there it also makes it more palatable uh eggs and bacon it's just oh it's so good i love those burritos <laughs> um, you can also make it as a it's taco beautiful. <laughs> and so uh, a lot of times for food we're just kind of ignorant about what to make and so I, I, my yeah. meal preps are very simple they you mass produce them you don't have to um you don't have to overcomplicate or make these like crazy fancy meals. You make a bunch of it. You have it all on hand. So you have no excuse about what not to eat. Cause sometimes we defer to just not eating cause we don't know what to do. And we just like the inaction is, mm -hmm. is, is too much effort to eat food. And so we just not eat. Um, and, and so, um, meal prepping it, having it always on hand is going to make it easier for that. So I think we touched mm -hmm. on a couple different aspects of how to gain weight and eat more. Do you have any, um, thoughts or, or questions about anything? Um, I know uh, your mod said it in chat, but a big thing with me is like, I have an issue with not even like an issue, but the idea of gaining muscle, it takes a long time. And I'm very much someone who like, I want to see the progress. I want to be able to like notice it. So it, it comes then circling back to that idea of not being good enough. Or like, I feel like if I'm not working out and I'm not noticing that strength increments growing a little bit. Or like I don't see that like my weight is starting to go up super fast. I feel like I'm failing at it. Mm -hmm. But as you're saying before, that's something I need to get more comfortable at in general. It's just yeah. being okay with that failure, which is, is something intrinsic in rock climbing. Yeah, one of the ways I view it because I, I relate to that too, where I, I also feel like I'm failing because I'm not making enough progress, stuff like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Progress is fast for your first year of proper bulking and cutting, progressive overload. Um, when you, when you learn this, you make huge gains in the short amount of time after that it is slow and the progress is not that noticeable. And I fall into the yeah. same mental trap too, where I feel like, am I doing enough? <laughs> am, like, am I yeah. like, am I making any progress? It's, it's actually really hard to see sometimes, but, um, I take a detached attitude from it of, I am a scientist in a lab doing experiments on my body of mm -hmm. titrating this up, turning this knob, do a little bit more activity in this way, a little more like this. It's not me. It's not my spirit. It's I'm a scientist in a lab playing around with my body, which sounds weird that I say it like that, but <laughs> I am experimenting. Yeah. I'm experimenting with my things. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, if I make mistakes, that's fine. It's just the experiment. It's not me. You know, it's not who I really am. Yeah. And so we're just like, okay, let's go back to the drawing board. The experiment didn't work. Okay, let's try again. You know, that detachment allows me to make failures and not ha be um, settled down with negative emotions and be able to uh, continue on. And and that's one aspect. The second aspect of it is um, realistic expectations of what to expect. I don't know about rock climbing, about what to, ex to expect, but for like training, if, for example, I were to coach you. And, and I know very little about rock climbing, but if I were to coach you about this, then I, and I, I would guess after what I say, think about how to frame this with other um, expert climbers and see what they think. But basically have a bulking phase, a strength gain phase where you put um, your, 
your things are going to suffer. You cannot have it all. You have to take turns in what you're focusing on for the next mesocycle or macro cycle or the next few months or year. And so for you, I would recommend across the board to bulk and to try to focus on getting stronger. Perhaps um, the skill of rock climbing would go to maintenance mode where you're going to rock climb just enough to maintain the skill that you have. So maybe instead of seven days of rock climbing, it would go down to two days or three days or whatever, whatever you think it takes to just be just good enough. <laughs> That's going to be tough. But anyway, <laughs> you yeah. get the idea. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's full circle. But anyway, um, yeah. but during the bulking phase, you're going to then focus your efforts on gaining strength on relevant skills that would tra transition over to rock climbing. What those are, I'm not yeah. sure. Just we kind of talked about it one time in the DMs, but just to like throw throw out random ideas, you would practice like salmon ladders. You would practice muscle ups or pull ups, and um, yeah. do it weighted and start progressing there. And that it will eventually, like while bulking and focusing on strength gains, there the focus isn't on your strength to weight ratio, except that part's gonna go to shit. Except that you are probably going to lose some skill in rock climbing that you had previously, but. You'll regain it later when you cut and you'll regain it, but you'll go into that bulking phase and you're going to be building muscle and some um, hopeful, uh, hopefully some better adaptations that will carry over once you get leaner again. And this is kind of like the general training focus where we, we will have to temporarily shift and accept some loss in some areas in order to make gains in other areas. And we cycle between them. Mm -hmm. That's one of the best ways to train, I think in general. So how to do a proper bulking phase, your other um, uh, climbing uh, experts will probably have some idea what that looks like. But um, what are your thoughts on that? I, I would completely agree with that. Uh, the idea of it's very hard to think about the correct way that it's going to translate, because the idea of bulking is so taboo in a sense in climbing, where people are constantly just trying to get stronger. They never really accept that sway that's going to happen if anything the sway is like okay i understand that like i'm not going for grades today i'm not going to be constantly trying to push my limit going from like v9 to v10 i'm going to be focusing on hangboarding focusing on isolating my muscles and my fingers and just having a day where i'm just going to like take super uh what's the word like load on my fingers that has no velocity right so if you're constantly moving and climbing then all of those movements have velocity behind it, and that's where the force load comes in onto your mm -hmm. fingers. So hangboarding allows you to train your fingers with no velocity at all in a very managed, set way, right? Focusing on that, or focusing on a couple months of just purely technique, right? Yeah. Having these like moments where you focus, specific, or even like, as you're saying, muscle ups, one arm pull ups is like a huge thing in climbing, even though at the end of the day, it really does nothing. You're never going to do a one-arm pull-up while you're rock climbing. But the idea of having that strength to then apply it into climbing afterwards, it's really about, like, separating those things so that once you start taking the time to, like, focus on those increments, your climbing will then get better in the long run. It's just yeah. hard for me to focus on the long run in general. Yeah, exactly. And one of the things that you touched on uh, reminds me of training volume. Basically, if you're constantly climbing seven days a week, that's too much training volume for your fingers, you don't have enough recovery in there yeah. to try to overload it on the hangboarding. But if you reduce the, the the training volume on your fingers from everyday climbing to just minimal climbing, then you'll free up a lot of recovery and stress from your fingers to then apply it to progressively overloading and getting stronger exactly. there. Yeah. Completely so, agree. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, Ethan, yeah. I, I feel like we're at a good stopping point. Do you, um, what yeah. do you think? I think that'd be perfect. I truly appreciate the conversation. You're a very good interviewer. Oh, you know a lot you. of knowledge. It's well, been very fun I mean, to talk about. Uh, yeah. Stop. I mean, <laughs> it's very it's nice good. to talk about. Yeah. Stop. It's, it's, like, like, continue a little bit. Yeah. I'm like, go on, go on. Just do, don't stop at all. <laughs> but, um, no, but I, I really appreciate the compliments. Um, yeah, uh, do you, uh, do you want to give us a few of your takeaways? Um, a lot of it is more in the sense that, like, I need to truly understand like what I'm doing at the end of the day, why I want to do what I'm doing, truly the idea of like why I enjoy climbing and do I really enjoy it? Do I want to progress? Am I doing it as a sense of just like trying to find a light at the end of the tunnel or is it to like actually have a light at the end of the tunnel? You know what I mean? I want to truly figure out the reason why I'm climbing and have it not just be for the idea of to escape 
you know i want like even though it is a coping mechanism for me as well as a passion i need to like find roots in the actual idea of climbing very much need to work on my idea and spirituality with a lot of things and my outlook on life in general because i'm not going to be able to improve rock climbing at all if i don't truly understand like myself at the end of the day and on top of that food food is something i need to work on a thousand percent i have very very bad eating habits in general but like i need to start meal prepping just in general just because i have a very bad idea of eating that to have these meals just like kind of on hand that I can just like throw into a microwave or throw onto a stovetop and then start to eat as well as like the idea of changing palatability that's definitely something I need to think about as well as those two uh exercises you gave me in terms of like trying to reduce stress in my stomach I'm going to rewatch the VOD later and get like exact mess or, like increments on that and try and figure out like ways to do that but that's definitely something that's going to help a lot the heating pads as well as like that uh acupuncture as technique you were saying with like the massaging definitely something i want to work on awesome um ethan yeah, before man. we finish up do you want to tell us more about your stream uh what it's about where people can find you mods could we do oh, shout yeah, outs please yeah <laughs> i feel so weird about i'm such a weird person with self brag about yourself but, yeah. i want to hear it okay <laughs> i hate it so I'll, much if you but, want uh, i'll help brag for yeah. you if you want me to but i, I want to uh, i'm going to get uh, some stuff wrong so i want to hear about it yeah so uh, I'm uh, currently what I'm doing is I'm streaming uh, every like three days a week. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to do a moonboard progression stream. So moonboarding is a very specific kind of rock climbing where it's like a very harsh angle. It's very finger intensive. You have a set system of holds that you can then connect to with an app on your phone and it'll light up in specific orders to create thousands and thousands of problem combinations. But the best problems are called the benchmarks. They're like the classics for every single grade. And my goal for the stream that I started about two, three months ago, it, it, it would be about three months ago now, where I'm trying to get every single benchmark problem, right? As a way to test strength, as a way to get stronger, as a way to like work on my weaknesses. As I was saying before, I'm very small. I'm five, six, and I have a negative four wingspan. So I'm not really built to rock climb, but that doesn't really stop me from trying to rock climb. So it's like a kind of way to figure out how to rock climb and how to rock climb better so uh my weaknesses would be having a small wingspan so getting better at being able to hold things on my maximum as possibly as extended as possible getting super strong i'm very dynamic climber so i climb with like a lot of movement and jumping but i should be able to like lock off which is just pulling as hard as possible being able to stay in that locked position and reach for things trying to really work on my weaknesses helps a lot with moonboarding in particular so it's like a way to show my progress and show myself getting stronger and being able to like look back on that. So the plan is to try and get every single benchmark problem. It's currently something that I can't physically do, but it's something that I'm trying to physically do. I didn't think I'd be able to get as far as possible, as, as far as I am currently. I'm currently halfway done with the, all the benchmarks. So I have 263 benchmarks out of 422. I have every single V4 done. I only have two V5s done. And then I have a handful in six and seven. And then V8 is where I actually climb. That's like the grade that I climb. But the moon board is a lot stiffer. So the grades don't really translate from the moon board to actual climbing as well as you think it would be. It's actually a lot harder. So like a V4 on the moon board could feel anywhere from like a V4 to a V8 in actual climbing because of how much more stiffer it is, how much more finger intensive it is. So it's something that I'm trying to work on in particular is to just get stronger, right? Yeah. And this is just a really good way to do it. And I didn't think I'd be able to get as strong as I am currently or as much progress as I am currently, but I'm getting a decent bit of progress and I'm pretty happy with where I am at the moment. And I hopefully I can get constantly or continue to get stronger. But as we found out in this interview, there's a lot I need to work on as yeah. well. <laughs> I was just say, hopefully yeah. you'll, you'll be more, uh, be able to continually feel like you're good enough <laughs> that as well yeah man that's uh, something i'm always working on but anyway yes weasel ethan everyone check him out twitch.tv slash weasel underscore Appreciate ethan it, yeah no problem uh check him out any other socials uh people should follow you on instagram under the same name is like the two that i and youtube under the same name but i i don't really post as much on youtube as i want to again that's a whole other separate issue that yeah, has yeah. to do with 
that not being like good enough. But we too much time for that. Yeah, yeah. Not enough time for that. Yeah, I mean, we can talk yeah. about it in the stream some other time, just chatting about content creation because oh, I have my own ideas about that as well. But um, yeah, I'd love all right. to. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Ethan, thanks again for coming by. I appreciate it. Oh, of course, my friend. Appreciate the conversation. If you like the content, like the content, comment, and subscribe on YouTube. Also, follow us on Twitch and leave the notifications on. Feed your brain, feed your body, and see you next time.